Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world of the International Fab Talks. We are really lucky and happy at the same time because we have several unsung heroes and we have several people who have achieved so much in their career and they are here with us sharing the space. They'd like to educate you, to empower you and to enhance your life in the right way. So many people, uh, irrespective of gender, irrespective of geographical location, any part in India and across the world, there are several people out there who have made it in spite of all the hardships that they have faced and are facing still. This is what makes us unique when we are able to overcome all the challenges that comes on our path. Today, join us, friends, to welcome our celebrity and guest. She's Miss Viji Sridhar. She's joining us all the way from Delhi. She's a wonderful person, very warm and down to earth and very friendly. This is what we love people without ego. There are several people who have achieved nothing at all and they have a lot of ego when you connect with them. But there are people like Viji Sridhar, ma'am, so down to earth in spite of all the achievements they have till date. We'll welcome ma'am and then begin the session. Hello, ma'am, and welcome to the session. Hello, Andrea. Thank you very much. I'm happy and honored to be here. Thank you, ma'am, for being so humble and kind and accepting the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. With your permission, I go ahead and share your profile and then we begin the session. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Dear friends, it's a privilege and our responsibility as well to share the profiles of our celebrities and guests. And today we are going to celebrate the life journey of our celebrity here. She is Vijay Sridhar. You must be wondering as to who she is, what she does. She's a wonderful educationist. Let's go more and check out as to who she really is. She's an educationist and at the same time, she's connected to, uh, like she's in the field of improving the lives of people around her. It could be children, it could be women, it could be just one and all. She's the regional mentor of change. Atal innovation mission Niti Ayo. Apart from that, I'd like to add more to her profile. Uh, she's a wonderful author, a career counselor, a life coach, WICCI president, rural development council Delhi, regional mentor of change that is Niti Ayo India as I mentioned earlier. She's currently an educational expert and the regional mentor who has taken up a task of mentoring students in Delhi region of India as the regional mentor of change aligning with the objectives of the Atal mission. Now we'll get to know as to what is all of this because it's a mystery to me. I've heard of it, but I didn't take that much of interest. But today we are going to go deep into that. We'll ask ma'am, what is it all about? Uh, why is she into all of this? Because she would love to cultivate 1 million children in India as neoteric innovators. If I'm getting that right, if I mispronounced it in the wrong way, ma'am is going to check me for that. Absolutely yes. correct. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Would you like to help me on that? Yeah, it is neoteric. Neoteric uh, innovators. Yes, dear. Thank That's you so much. And it is focusing mainly on creating curiosity, creativity, imagination, where in the young minds. This is what we all have to do as adults to, you know, enhance the curiosity, the creativity and the imagination skills that our young ones have instead of putting them down or suppressing them, and also to inculcate skills such as design mindset, creative computational thinking, adaptive learning, etc. So ma'am focuses on these beautiful areas. She also works in the lines of the Atal Innovation Mission, which has created workspaces, tinkering labs, and incubation centers where young minds can learn innovative skills, sculpt ideas to hand-on activities, work and learn in flexible environments, etc. She also conducts several workshops to empower the youth with the 21st century skills. This is really very important. We all should, including the children, the youth and senior citizens, middle-aged people like us, we all should really have the 21st skills or the 21st century skills with us. Otherwise, then we are nowhere in this digital space. We all should acquire those skills. And uh, what are these skills? It could be something connected with creativity, innovation, critical thinking, design thinking, social and cross-cultural collaboration. I love this, social and cross-cultural collaboration. We ask ma'am, what is it more about? If many of you don't know about it, we could go ahead and discuss about it. Ethical leadership. This is also beautiful. I love this, ethical leadership and so on. She strives to build and help uh, in innovating solutions for countries in which when they face unique problems. So like 
focusing on innovative solutions for various countries with regard to the unique problems that each country faces and thereby supports India in all its effort to grow as a knowledgeable economy and ecosystem. As the president of Rural Development Council, Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, she has organized several programs for rural women empowerment and girl child education. That's so nice. She works for their financial freedom and not only financial freedom, it is mental well-being, the emotional stability. All of this ma'am ma focuses on. She is the national advisor for human rights and dignity wing. She is a proud recipient of various international and national awards for her contribution in the field of education. Uh, just to mention a few of the awards and rewards that she's received, Exceptional Women of Excellence Award in the year 2023 from Women Economy Forum London, Teacher Innovation Award by Arabindo Society, Best Teachers Award 2018 by the International Standard Association Dubai, Iconic Women Creating a Better World for All by WEF 2022, Dr. Radhakrishna Memorial Award and Sardar Patel National Award for Commendable Service in the field of education. That is so nice. When you empower yourself, when you educate yourself, or when you're being privileged to get an education, and you know that education is important, you would love to see everyone around you being educated. And here is an angel empowering others to become what they should become instead of ignoring and you know being selfish in this world there are people like ma'am who focuses on building a beautiful society with all the positive energy from each one of the people that she comes in contact with and of course from the universe she derives a lot of positive energy hello ma'am and thank you so much for being here you have a wonderful profile and i like the way you're connected with the rural women the girl child educational uh, part that you're focused on innovative thinking, innovative, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas and skills, all of that. It's really magical. I really love that. And I would want every woman in the world to be like you, including me. Instead of simply sitting down and complaining, get up and let's do something and serve the society in the right way. We all have a purpose in life. So ma'am, I just shared something about you in a very brief way. People would love to hear it from you. They would love to hear it directly from you as to who is the real Miss Viji Sridhar, over to you, dear. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's a wonderful, you know, introduction that you had given to me, but I was, you know, overwhelmed actually speaking. Um, uh, I'm a very simple person. I'm coming from a very simple background, like, you know, from a southern part of India, right? And uh, there people, when I was in my young age, I always, I have always seen women suppressed there. You know, even in my own family, women uh, never used to be, you know, given that kind of a liberty because we were conservative and we were a kind of an orthodox family. That was the time when I thought, yes, women should come out mm -hmm. and speak up for themselves or maybe they have to voice their only thing the hero that of my life was my dad who was never, you know, he has given he had given us all freedom. I'm the, you know, in the filial rank, I'm the fourth in the member of my family. I have two sisters and one brother. So that way, it was a very, very simple life that I've gone through. And then uh, coming here, and now you have given me an opportunity to speak about myself. And I'll definitely speak in the due course. You'll be getting to know about what all I have achieved. Not achievement. I wouldn't say it is an achievement. What all I've been you know, exposed to and what has shaped me into what I am today. What led me to this particular path, which I have chosen today. And why? And we need to be you know, open to all the avenues that are around us. That is very important for a woman in life. And she should be, you know, willing to change or willing to accept the new challenges she's facing. Okay. That is what I want to tell the new generation. Now, I'll just take up your questions and then I'll give the answers to them respectively. That's, right. that's lovely. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It was crisp, clear, with lots of clarity. Thank you so much. Now, ma'am, why did you choose the field of education? There were other professions as well, the medical profession, it could be, uh, you know, the MNCs or you could say the corporate sector as well. Why did you come into the field of education? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Actually, you have already put it across like, you know, it was my choice. It wasn't out of no choice. I, generally, people say I accidentally entered into a profession, but that doesn't work for me. This was my conscious choice that I need to be in the field of education because I thought this is where I can really shape the young India. 
maybe if i have to leave an impact this is where i can really do it with the young children where i want to just want to change their mindset because the entire you know we are so conditioned in a particular way of thinking there is nothing called as a growth mindset or what i have seen in my own days i'm telling you that was a very fixed mindset that i was grown up so that is when i thought yeah i need to change the mindset maybe in the at the young age of the students and one more inspiration obviously you know taking going into this profession is my own teacher i had a very wonderful you know english teacher uh, her name is sara miss okay we used to call her sara miss and this this sara miss was my you know all all everything she was the one who really made me realize yes girls i was in a convent uh, school and uh, there i was a very timid and uh, you know kind of a student who used to always prefer don't disturb me tag i put a don't disturb me tag and sit in one corner i never used to come out with all my feelings and she was the one who pulled that myself out and she said we need to speak and we need to speak and that the, the love and affection i got from my teacher then i thought yes the teacher can really work wonders she can really make a uh, miracles in a child's life that was when i decided yes maybe if at all i take up a profession i become a teacher and i become a mentor so that i leave an impact in a child's life that was very important for me so i took nobody in my family are teachers i'm the first teacher <laughs> in my family yeah and i mentor students as well i'll talk about the mentorship of atal innovation mission later yeah wonderful that was wonderful that's great that's really it is now ma'am did you face any challenge when you came into this field did somebody stop you or oppose your progressive thinking because you changed your mindset like not to be stagnant in the same place to go ahead surge ahead so when you were on this journey of rediscovering yourself and entering into the field of progressive thinkers did you face any challenge like anybody stopped you or tried to put a barrier uh, on your path uh as such as i told you uh there weren't many women who used to come out of the life and work working women were very less during my time like you know people did not come out to work and you know? they were just you know confined to their own house household chores and they used to be you know the place for a woman was always i've seen with my mother and my sisters was generally mm -hmm. it's a kitchen where they are always there you know then uh, though my father as i told you he has never put a full stop or never did he you know kind of restrict any kind of a liberation of women he was always uh, supporting a woman coming ahead and you know working a class so i didn't have a problem as such but later i did feel some men were there in the workplace who always used to you know uh, have a kind of a upper hand showed a upper hand over the women wanted to suppress women they never wanted us to you know take up a you know administration uh, job or maybe they never used to help us grow in the field of education there were some which were uh, more of you know stepping stones for me they were challenges but then they definitely helped me grow also they helped me discover myself also if they were not there had they not said no maybe probably i would not have found myself as much as i have done today Yeah. that's really nice you explain that so well you you put all your challenges in the right way and how you said that they were stepping stones to success absolutely yes that has built you and made you who you are today now ma'am we'd like to know about this atal mission niti ayog what is this all about i've just read about it in the newspapers i've heard it or, or on various tv channels but what is it I, i don't have much information if you could share that yeah this is atal innovation mission it is a flagship initiative by the niti ayog government of india now uh, the actual uh, process is that they have started the atal tinkering labs in many schools maybe around 10000 schools all over india so for the starting of the lab they are giving the grant of uh, around a few lakhs of amount is been given to the school so that they start up a kind of a they start a lab in the schools where it is a free space tinkering space for the students where they can enter the lab and they can you know all the equipments are uh, you know paid by the government government gives a grant for them they can purchase the experiment uh, kits they can purchase a 3d printer there and almost all the sensors are there all the equipments for a child to innovate so because generally all schools do have the labs you must have seen the labs are there chemistry lab physics lab and the bio lab no tinkering lab is there 
Tinkering is basically what is an innovation lab. It is a, a maker space. It is a space where it's a free space for the students to work. And uh, no restrictions there, no curriculum as such where we have, if at all I go to a chemistry lab or a physics lab, I have a um, set of curriculum where I need to follow only this experiments are done, only that experiment. But here you have just a space where you can enter, your ideas are given a form, you just come inside the lab with an idea. So that kind of workspaces are being created for the young minds uh, by the government just to develop their innovative skills and uh, they can um, creativity they bring out with the creativity then later on the ideate ideation is taking process uh, taking their place and ideal ideation thinking and uh, you know then they come out with a the prototyping they come out with some model first thing they enter the lab with a kind of a you know problem statement so there are five steps which they need to follow empathizing they should know what exactly is a problem to know the problem, you should empathize, you should be in their shoes. Suppose I want to innovate in the field of an agriculture. I need to go to the field, talk to the farmers, know what their problem is. I should know, then I come to the lab so that I get a clear idea of, yes, they are facing this problem. Probably with my idea, I can solve this problem. So they have the equipments in the lab. They are innovating there, they are ideating, and we are the mentors who are facilita facilitating them in this process. Okay. We as a facilitators, we help them. I'm a mentor there. So I be in the lab. I will help them build their you know, ideas and then come out with a prototype. A prototype is basically a model, which is a non-working model. It is not a working model, but it's a non-working model, just a small miniature of their uh, solution to the problem that we have been facing in any field. It can be a field of education. It can be a field of anything, medical, medical field, or it can be agricultural field anywhere, right? They come out with a kind of a ideation and we build their ideas. We help them build their ideas. They are given a you know, platform to showcase their ideas. Projects are developed. They showcase, this is, I'm talking about the school children. And you'll not believe it, Andrea, they come out with excellent ideas, excellent solution for the problems. I mean, one would never think of like, you know, such kind of, you know, because they are given the space to work. They're given the freedom to work. And they are given uh, all the necessity, you know, resources to work. So they are coming out with wonderful ideas. And now they, we help them to build the ideas. We connect them with the AICs. AIC is basically incubation centers in the universities, in the research institutes. School students, after developing a particular model, they are connected with the AICs. They are going to be tied up with AICs. And there they are developed. They have the research labs there. They can. They are still mentored. Their process is again mentored by the higher authorities, and it is taken up to a higher level. Once they come out with a viable product that can be launched in the market, young students have become the entrepreneurs today. They are all entrepreneurs. All these school-going children are entrepreneurs. They are having a lot of, you know, products, online products, digital products. They have come out with the digital products. So many apps are there. So many digital products are there that they have floated. So this is what we are building. We are building innovative young India. They're coming here. The startup culture is being in the making, actually. The startup culture of very young age is in the making. So we are going to have a boom of uh, startup culture in India, where India is not going to be what it is today. In a, uh, another 10 years, it's going to be totally different, where the digital you know, convergence and the digital uh, disruptions would take place, obviously, but convergence would also take place. And transformation is already in the making. Digital transformation is already done. So this is what is happening. It's a huge, it's a kind of a flagship initiative where uh, nearly 1 million, we are targeting so many students to be, you know, as innovators. Now the entire, con entire world is looking up to India now, you know, all young India, Indians are coming ahead with all the innovations in all fields. I would love to talk about this, uh, you know, uh, at a length, but I don't think <laughs> time constraint. So I'll have to put a full stop to this. But it's a wonderful initiative, which I have joined hands with. And uh, it's a great mission. And they are rewarding out of uh, nearly we are 6,000 and above. Mentors are there all over India. And every year, uh, you know, uh, those mentors who have gone uh, out of their way to help, you know, walk the long way to help, you know, the uh, mentoring the children are felicitated uh, in a round table. And uh, only 30, 32 mentors are out of 6,000 are felicitated as gems of Mentor India. And I'm 
really proud to be the gem of Mentor India. This is my consecutive three, three, third year that I've been, you know, given the, actually, I would say it's a jewel in my crown. I've been uh, given that title. I'm a gem of Mentor India. I proudly state that <laughs> for the third time. So I wish all youngsters, you know, come up with wonderful ideas and make much use of this Atal uh, Tinkering Labs. Okay, we have nearly 10,000 schools with these labs. That is about it. Yes, dear ma'am, that's really wonderful, ma'am. That's really great. Thank you so much for sharing it. And I could see you beaming with joy when you were sharing it. Yeah, you were so happy to share all of that. Absolutely. That's really nice. And uh, you are so positive about the future, as you say, like India will not be what it is today in the next 10 years. No. That's a beautiful, uh, you know, progressive thought about. There are many people who complain that India is not going to be fine and so-and-so is happening, corruption and so-and-so. But you look on the positive aspects and say that India is going to shine brightly yes. and it would definitely make a wonderful place in this and world. And this generation that is coming up, Andrea, it is the, you know, now we are in the Gen Z. I'm catering to Gen Z. But the generation that is coming, right, the alpha generation is going to be too good. India is having, a, it's a young India. We have got too many young uh, population old uh, senior citizens are less in India as compared to the other countries, right? We have the young India is uh, nearly 70-75% of the population is all young Indian. So these Indians are going to come up with wonderful ideas and uh, the entire world is going to look up to India now. That is what is happening. And uh, it's a long way to go, though, but I'm very positive about we are going to walk the mile. <laughs> That's really nice. You make us visualize a happy India contributing to the entire world in a beautiful way. Now, ma'am, I'm really very curious to know how did you move from southern India to the north part of India to Delhi? How did you go so far? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually speaking, uh, my birthplace is Delhi. My mother was uh, mother was in Delhi. She did her schooling. Mother is from Delhi only. And um, she moved to south after marriage. So that way she is a Delhiite, more of a Delhiite. And then she moved to uh, southern part. My father is from south. So she shifted there. Then when I was born, obviously I was born in my uh, grandparents' place, which is in Delhi. My birthplace is Delhi. Then um, after marriage from Chennai, I came to Delhi, just an opposite of what my mother did. She From Delhi, she went there. And after marriage, my husband was in Delhi. And uh, he's an architect by profession. So he's here settled for more than, I would say, 1970, he's here. So that way, it's just happened like, you know, after marriage, one has to shift uh, the base. So I came here. And uh, that was the time when I didn't know much about the, you know, Delhi, uh, Hindi and all these things that language barriers are always there. <laughs> so how to take up a job? You know, here, you know, taking up a job means you should know the local language. You need to, you know, I did face a lot of challenges here. I couldn't go to even a local market to buy things because I know only English. And uh, I used to know uh, English and obviously my local language, Tamil, I know, and Telugu, Kannada, yes, I know. But Hindi is something which I had to learn. Then I used to go to the shops and tell them ki how to buy things. I used to tell them what is the price. If they say the price, I don't know Hindi. I used to see the carton. What is written? MRP is written there. Then I used to be. That was a kind of a challenge I faced. Then I thought, yeah. It's not a difficult thing. Let me learn Hindi. And then if I have to be here, I need to be, you know, I need to know the local language. It is not justified if I say I don't know Hindi. No. Then I learned it. Then um, now I'm well versed in Hindi. I can speak Hindi because I'm, uh, I've taken up a job. Uh, again, it's not in the, you know, it's an NCR, not in Delhi. So those students generally expect me to teach them in local language as well. They can't, you know, like, you know, they can't, I can't stick to English alone. They need me to speak to speak to them in Hindi as well. So then I spoke, I have learned Hindi and I'm now <laughs> well versed in Hindi. Yeah, that is the story. Basically, after marriage, we do have this kind of a you know system of shifting the base from a parental place to the uh, in-laws place. That's the way. Yes, dear. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing. I could visualize that young Viji going out in the market and you know being confused at the language that is being spoken over there. But okay. yet you overcome all of that and today you're well versed in Hindi as well. That's okay. excellent. Now, ma'am, you are working for the women folk. 
yeah empowering them financially so if you could share that how and who could benefit from this who could come forward and take the advantage of gaining financial independence because several women lack of financial independence make them doormats in their own house make them you know undergo uh, any uh, unexplainable torture yeah at the hands of their own parents or their in-laws it could be their husband or it could be just anybody once you are financially independent you can take control of your life so how is this all you are into it and how you are guiding and helping others if you could share that uh, actually uh, andrea i am uh, uh, associated with the women's council of uh, you know commerce and industry there i've taken up the i'm i've been appointed as the president and i have a team of uh, 25 members under me i have a vice president as well as i have my team members from all fields of all of women women uh, empowerment of delhi rural women empowerment of delhi we are taking care of so what we do generally is we we tap the you know uh, skills we teach them skills and we tap the skill. already you know women generally they underestimate their power they don't have that confidence or maybe they don't even know them they have not yet discovered themselves many of them what we came across when we were you know doing this kind of workshops for them skill development workshops for them we came to know that many of them have the wonderful talents which they didn't even know that they had it so some are very good in the you know stitching some of them are very good in that you know worldly art and they are able to do the art so these things what we do is generally these kind of skills of the women rural women we uh, tie them up with the industries and where they can you know or maybe they go through us so we can sell that whatever they are making the entire amount whatever is been given to them they make uh, you know table mats tea coasters and small uh, decorative items whatever they make we make it a point that industrial uh, you know sometimes diaries uh they make the you know handmade papers and you know stitching and you know uh, many things that they do all these things we make it a point that we tie them up with the industries where they uh, gift vouchers like you know those generally industries and the companies need some uh, gifts to be given to their employees during some occasions festivals so we tie them up with the uh, companies and the industries where they earn for themselves and then uh, many girls are there who don't go to school so you know, generally in india you also must be knowing women the girl child is always you know uh, asked to take care of the siblings she is retained she is retained at home to do the household chores she takes care of the household work and her education is always put at the back burner it they say ki it's not needed a woman has to be educated still it is there the mindset is still there at the rural areas so we do go take a kind of a you know interactive sessions with them the parents and we appraise them of what exactly you're doing when you're going to educate your uh, girl child at home and if you educate a girl child at home it is not the one child you're educating it is the entire family you're educating that girl if it is educated if she is educated she is going to be you know you're educating a family this is what we tell them and now many of them have understood whatever they have to do for a girl and they are not going to you know treat uh, her uh, you know as a uh, lesser lesser than the boys okay in the house so equality we just basically work for the equality and uh, more than equality we work for the equity the equitable treatment for a woman okay that is very important and adult educations also we uh, do take care of the uh, older women who need to be you know into the education of you know they should know the basic uh, calculations basic mathematics or basic things that's happening around them all these things we do take uh, we take them out also for a kind of you know outing let us enjoy see your joy is also important right be, you being happy is also important this is what we say we take them out we enjoy with them if a person if a woman is happy the entire family is happy that's what we teach them it's very important that women needs to be happy from within actually yeah that is what we do a little bit that we can do to the society and uh, we are growing in it we are doing on a you know larger scale like you know national it's basically on a national level i'm doing it so i have my team in the Na- uh, nagpur area in the nagpur area they are doing uh, their own part workshops and everything is conducted they go the food food uh, 
uh, balanced diet why is it important education field they are teaching them infrastructure why is it important the, you know many many places they don't have the you know washrooms for women separately like all these things are taken care of by the team they do, do uh, report to me uh, and uh, we try to you know solve their problems to the extent that is possible that's what we are doing and brilliant, uh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, ma'am, you are all into this, deep into this field, connecting women, empowering women, making them enjoy their life, giving them, you know, that sense of feeling that they value themselves yeah. and the family members value them for who they are and for the skills that they have. They always, always underestimate the power within themselves, as you right. mentioned that. And, uh, if the woman is happy in the house, then the entire house is happy. You mentioned such beautiful things today, ma'am, on this platform. That's wonderful for that wonderful answer. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you're so supportive. I know that's really wonderful. Yeah. Like, you know, the burden should be shared equally with, with really. the male and the female members at home. Don't put only the burden on the male members. I mean, yeah. like uh, they have been conditioned that they are the ones who have to be the breadwinners. They are the ones who have to take care of everything. Yeah. And they forget to, you know, enjoy their lives. Absolutely. A few of them, those who are oversensitive or, you know, deep thinkers, it's for you, my dear friends, who feel like it's, it's or the burden is on me or maybe the responsibility is on my shoulder. Now, this, the responsibility is being shared. You put that so well. That's Absolutely. very well. We are uh, talking well, about equality. We talk about equality means it's not only for women. Very it's, true. It's, it's men also. Men are shouldering a lot of responsibilities. Why not share? Equal. Let us make it equal. We can also share it. When we expect men to share the space in the kitchen, why not in the drawing room? We can also share the, you know, in the workplace also we can share it. That's what we can do. Yes. So men also have to change their mindset as well as women has already changed the mindset, I believe. <laughs> yeah. I really like your answer. You're very, very uh, right on that. Thank you so much. Now, ma'am, this is one sensitive question. Yeah. Now, as a woman, you might have watched uh, and viewed many families and many women struggling uh, with alcoholic partners or parents or maybe the father being an alcoholic or a brother being an alcoholic and the entire family is disturbed. So alcoholism is a disease. Now if, and it affects the entire family. So if what I have this in my personal, my, uh, my personal opinion, why doesn't the government of India stop the sale of liquor i have this very big question every day in my head so if we stop the sale of liquor several innocent families would be saved and we would have a wonderful world now a wonderful india will not talk about other countries we'll only talk about india because several innocent families innocent uh, uh, children are being affected because of alcoholism now, how would you take this question what would you like to say from your side yeah, I agree with you. Even I have, I'm of the opinion that why, when we know it very well, not only liquor, even the cigarettes, we keep, you know, saying that smoking is injurious to health. Every movie, beginning of the movie, we show that slide. Why not ban it? Really? Why don't you ban it? Why we keep on saying now what happens is basically now the choice is left to the individual. We are showing it, it's injurious and still you're... So we need to ban all these things. I mean, I'm really supportive of this particular thought. And uh, I may walk uh, a number of miles to, you know, do whatever it takes so that I can, you know, ban it. <laughs> yes. I, I only wish. Because these two are of no use because the entire family, there are so many, what I was telling you about the dysfunctional families and the children that are, you know, really exposed to this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, treatment of mother. In front of him, the mother is being treated very badly. And uh, that is not going to, you know, it's definitely affecting his uh, entire well-being. And I think government has to come out with some of the other, you know, restrictions that is very, very, you know, vital for the well-being of the entire uh, fraternity of the, you know, human beings. That's definitely there. Yes. I suppose. You. Let us work on it. <laughs> Let us see what can be done. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and the sad reality today in the 21st century, several young women too are into it. They are also consuming alcohol and they are being abused uh, in their, you know, intoxicated uh, situations. If they are into any, uh, you know, if they are highly intoxicated, they don't know what's happening with them. Young women, young girls are also into it. 
Sudhi also should come out of it. It should be totally banned. This is to the government of India, the head of the department. I don't know, who, Mr. Modi ji, oh, or yeah. whoever is going to lead India now in the uh, when the when the election results are declared, would love a big ban on sale of alcohol, cigarettes, and tobacco. Uh, it would really be wonderful. I mean, it's just a personal opinion. We leave it up to the <laughs> authorities. Now, dear, I'd love to know about you as a youngster. How was little Viji? Was she the shy girl or the yes. very vibrant one, talkative one? I was actually a very, you know, go-getter. I was very, oh. you know, uh, <laughs> I was the life of the entire, you know, students. They all, there were so many friends I had. I used to be, uh, I had a lot of leadership qualities. And I was a very good theatrical person. I love, you know, uh, to be on stage. And I was always in the school also. I was always given a kind of for the main lead role in the school. You know, uh, either it is an alma mater. I was the alma mater of my uh, school or maybe the, you know, head of the Jew community. I was in a convent, as I told you. I used to be the Jesus Christ or the main role was given to me so that I, I was very good at theatres. I mean, uh, only thing is we didn't have any kind of, you know, nowadays we have a lot of theater workshops and that and this, you know, you have got um, National School of Dramas and all those things. Now, those days we didn't have anything, but it was all in, in uh, it was learned by myself. Like I used to act very well. Acting came to be very naturally. And uh, same, similarly, I was a very good, you know, collaborator and a leadership quality was there with me. And because uh, I have seen my uh, friends, I had nearly 20 friends during my uh, young days and uh, 20, 25 friends used to come to my house and we all, and it, you know, about the house at South, we had a huge space around the house, you know, so there we used to have lots of trees and, you know, to play around. So all of them, we used to be outside the house and all used to wait for me to, you know, tell what game are we going to play? Acha, what are we going to play with They used to ask me. So that was a leadership quality like, you know, I had. <laughs> so, and we used to go on, uh, one very interesting thing is, we always used to, you know, board a bus. We never used to think about the destination. We just used to take a ticket to the uh, last uh, stop. And we used to travel like anything. And whichever place we like in between, probably we asked the driver to stop the bus and we get down. We were so daring. We were so daring. Because those were the days when we had no fear. I haven't seen a, I haven't seen any uh, so-called bad men that those days. I haven't seen anybody being bad to us, anybody being worse. Uh, I mean, uh, treating us very badly. No, I haven't seen anybody. All were good. People around me always. Everybody had been good. So we never had that fear of going alone outside. But nowadays, it's such a threat. Going mm. out means it's such a threat. Like you know, one has to be very cautious going out alone. And I feel the same with my daughters. I can't leave them alone. And I, as a mother, keep, you know, worrying till the day they turn up. So that was a thing. And uh, I was really good in studies. I was uh, the topper uh, in the school. As far as the uh, English and the science subject goes, I was the topper in the school. And I was uh, felicitated by the board uh, CBSE people, they had come to school and they had given me a gold medal. That was my first gold medal I got. You know, the gold medal size was so huge. <laughs> I was so happy getting that, and uh, I enjoyed my childhood. I enjoyed my chill, uh, you know, schooling. I thoroughly enjoyed. I had no restrictions. Would you believe it, Andrea? If I say I started earning uh, a bit uh, in my eighth standard. And uh, that was a time when I had volunteered to serve uh, in a Congress ground. There is a ground there in Chennai, Congress grounds we call it, where the industrial exhibitions used to take place. So in those industrial exhibitions, all the industries, big giant industries would come and display their products and they would, uh, you know, um, pitch their product rather. So that was a time they needed some volunteers to, in fact, make the announcements. They didn't have no cell phone that was the age where they didn't have any cell phone so they used to have a kind of a, um, a reception area where we had a landline and any call coming to that particular um, uh, person and we used to just announce so i was an announcer there i was working in as, as an announcer and i earned money and mm -hmm. i was so happy in eighth standard i used to earn money and for that i had to take permission from my headmistress and my sister i went to her 
everybody used to tell tell me ki my friends told me ki no no you will not get permission how can you get permission to go for, for one month you have to go for working but you will be marked present here in the school it's not possible i don't think you'll be given the attendance then i went and spoke i was a bit daring i went there i spoke to sister i could half a day i'll attend the school and the rest of the half day i'll be working and the amount that i'm getting i'll be donating it to the uh, students so i was a uh, you know in the sos associated with the seva souls as organization in the school so i told i will earn for the organization i'll give it to the organization so that we can buy some books and water bottles and papers and all those things for the uh, less privileged students so obviously the sister agreed to it and i used to give all the money i earned to the school and that was a wonderful thing you know <laughs> i had a great experience in 8th standard 8th standard means you can say what is the age it was around uh eight, 10 years it tend to you know uh not 10 years say 14 years right that 14, was the, i guess 13 14, 13 14 yeah that age was the you know i started earning that was a big thing for me <laughs> that's really nice i could visualize that young viji standing in front of the principal and asking her boldly you know you put it very well that you know i am going to return back the money get back the money and you know donate it for a good cause i think yeah. that's what you know made her merit and give you the permission <laughs> i guess because nuns are quite strict in certain ways but yeah, yes right. when you talk of charity when you talk of charity they are going to merit and they are going to come yeah, down absolutely and they gave me attendance for one month they wow. gave me present and half a day i used to immediately push off from the school and i used to go there i work i bring the money next day i give it to them and that way you know uh, every day payment hota tha. like you know they used to give me the payment uh, uh, on the day wise okay that was a meager amount it wasn't like you know maybe uh, maybe 25 30 rupees or something of that sort which was big that those days it was big those days 30 rupees per day means it's a big thing for me so i used to come and give it to them so they were happy <laughs> excellent excellent wonderful ma'am and you had the kind heart to share it with them yeah, yeah. That's really nice. That's wonderful. I just want, now also, Andrea, now also, if I, I would earn, I, you had a question rather, when will you retire? Or maybe you had, I, I don't think I'll be retiring because, you know, after even leaving the school, maybe I'll be going, I'll continue my work as long as I can earn money and give it to the society. I'll definitely do that. It's money, need, you need not work and earn for yourself. It is just to give back also, you need money. You can't give something which you don't have. I need to give something means I need to have it first. Yes. So even love, even the affection, I need to have it first. Then only I can give it. Money, I need to have it first so that I can give it. So I earn more to give it more. Okay. That's what my philosophy is. Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. That's wonderful. Now, ma'am, let's talk about your college life. Did you ever bunk college anytime? Like go for movies? Or you were very, what do you say, honest <laughs> and you know? I didn't. I bunked a lot. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I wasn't that, you know, uh, innocent girl. Though, I mean, I bunked a lot. To be very frank, I had a gang of students. And uh, my college was, you know, fortunately very close to the seaside. Of strict action was not there probably, or maybe they didn't know uh, that we bunked. I don't know how about it. But we were never punished. That way, you know, we were fortunate, I would say. <laughs> we were never punished. <laughs> Yes, dear. Now we have the cameras that's going to capture us if we escape college or whatever. Every, we are under, you know, yeah. a surveillance, surveillance all, all the time. All the time, yeah. Not yeah. only in college, in schools also we have surveillance and nothing can be done without, you know, uh, being monitored. So that way, that time we didn't have anything. <laughs> we yeah. were so fortunate, I would say. <laughs> now, ma'am, did you have a uniform while you were in college or was it just normal? <laughs> No, no, no uniform in college. You spent a lot of time in Chennai as well and in Delhi as well. Now, what kind of cuisine you love? Is it the north part of India, the dish over dishes over there, that north cuisine or the south? Uh, let me be very honest. I love South Indian dishes very much. Though I'm here and I'm compelled to have the north Indian dishes, that's a uh, part of the you know lifestyle here because of my family members who like uh, only North Indian like chapatis and uh, sabzi and roti sabzi, parathas and all. But I love South Indian dishes. Still, I make. Uh, today also I made rasam for myself. <laughs> I love rasam. I like idlis. I like sambar. I like all those things. 
uh, probably I've been having it for so many years there. Maybe I have that, you know, uh, liking for that. And I can never, never, I can never leave them. I love them like anything. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm sure like South Indian food is one of the best, you know, fulfilling yeah. dishes that we feel. Definitely. And the best vegan food is South Indian yes, food. Very when you talk about, uh, you know, when people are now turning to be vegans and all. Vegans, generally, you know, we have the sambar and dressam and all and uh, this idli, dosa and all the best vegan food you can have around the world is uh, South Indian food. Apart from all the other foods that they have. So it's always good for health also. It's all steamed food, right? It's good. Idlis and all are very good. <laughs> yes, that's very nice, ma'am. Thank you for sharing. No, ma'am, we'll shift our focus to something very sensitive. This has always been on my mind. Like many of the schools and colleges have not focused on having sessions about teenage pregnancy. Yeah. What are the measures, you being an educationist, what are the measures you've already taken along with your team or what should measures should we take in future you know to focus on teenage pregnancies to avoid them to educate them in the right way because nowadays when you go to any of the school managements and you speak to them that we want to have a session uh, and educate children with regard to teenage pregnancy they, they say we don't have time we are more focused on marks they are more focused on the neat exams on je mains all of that they are not connected with reality marks will come but once the child is affected, you know, as the teenage uh, hormones, I, all of that, I don't need to share all of that. What can we do or what has been done and what can we still do to save our young teenagers and let them become parents or mothers or fathers for that matter at the right time, if you could share something from your end. Yeah, the very first thing is, Andrea, I somehow feel the parents need to be educated on this. Because the moment we speak about this in the class or maybe the moment we, you know, have a kind of a session with students, the uh, there is a rebuttal from the parent side that what is the need for you people to do this? What is it? When my, my child has didn't even know about it, the moment you sp speak it openly like this, so she has been, you know, disturbed. She has been disturbed. She's coming and asking me all sorts of questions. So this is what is happening. So what I feel is we need to have a kind of a session for the parents first. And it is healthy. They should realize that it's healthy to talk about all these things openly with the children. Either you people talk. If the thing that you're not able to talk, if the mother and the father can sit across the table and talk to your children openly, that should be the dialogue, actually speaking. If they can talk, uh, make them comfortable speaking about this, then in the school, we can also... And to be very frank, in school, we are doing it as a science teacher. I do take science. And it's a class of eight standard, right? I take classes for eight standard uh, adolescents because that is the age when it's the adolescent age they are entering into. I talk to them regarding the reproductive health. I talk to them regarding the uh, adolescent problems. And they come out with excellent questions. In the closed close room, both boys and girls are there. I make them comfortable to speak. I make them comfortable to listen. There are people, there are students who start laughing and giggling, which I put immediate full stop to that. It's absolutely good to know about your body. It is a must that you must know about your anatomy. Yes, are after speaking that, then they keep quiet and they actually are interested. Only thing is they want to have a kind of a closed dialogue. Now, when it goes to a kind of a, you take it in an auditorium, they don't want. So I visit the classes. From the class 8 standard, 8, 9, 10, 11. So from st it starts from 8. In fact, nowadays it has to go to 6th and 7th also. What I feel. Because the younger, the children are really, you know, they are uh, uh, exposed to so much of media, unwanted stuffs, and they have half knowledge of what is done and what is, that is dangerous. So we have counsellors in our school. We have counsellors and I, I being the career counsellor and I being the life coach also. I do take some sessions in the school also. Apart from my regular teaching of chemistry, I do take some sessions of these things also. So it is a must. Yeah, I agree to you. It is a must that students should be knowing about what exactly are the physical changes occurring during the puberty. 
how they have to take care of themselves once they once they attain the puberty at what age they have to attain and how are they going to take uh, guard themselves from all these kind of things that is very important very important where they have to put a full stop to the proximity of a student or maybe a man in their life or maybe the men women in their life they both are equal both many, are. many uh, both are equal like you know there are many women who go closer to the men and there are more men who come closer to the women uh, inappropriately okay so if they come like that they should know where to put a full stop where to draw a line how long they can come how closer they can come that has to be taught to the children because they are very young they need to be taught absolutely and before that parents need to feel comfortable and uh, they need to trust their teachers actually uh, many times what happens nowadays parents don't trust teachers they don't trust teachers at all like they have a kind of apprehension uh you now how can you uh, torture my child or how can you you have mentally disturbed my child by talking like this all these things that should not be there they should know that we are there to educate and we are there to save as much as you know they are interested in their child we are also the interested in their child that should be there the faith and trust is a very important thing andrea this trust and faith is a very important thing they should have parents and both teachers and parents both of them are working towards the same target same objective that is educating the child that's it they should know that yes dear no ma'am i have another important question this is a very sensitive one children are being abused by their own kith and kin it could be the father it could be the brothers the cousins the uncles grand grandfathers or grand we'll put it in as grandparents now young children are abused it could be either gender or number now what i personally want is the children having that platform where they can come to the school and have somebody there to share that this is what happened to me at home when i was al alone this is this is what happened because if they tell it to their mom she will sweep it under the carpet absolutely so they have to save the family honor that's one thing till date it is it's like you know family prestige they don't want to put anybody out now we do we have things in place or certain systems in place or counselors etc or some professional who's there where the child can go quickly and say this is what happened to me i've been physically abused sexually abused or i've been beaten uh, very badly by my own family members or even it could be the neighbors or a close by shopkeeper to may take advantage of the child and even online uh, you know, yeah online scams you know children are made to reveal their um, physic and yeah. you know they are being trapped by the elderly people who act as children and join those platforms where the children are all of you know uh, in that group so it's like a very big issue now what uh, i am looking forward is do educational institutions have something in place where children can walk up to them into that room quickly and share like yeah. you being an educationist how far can we how far have you come into this phase or you know what can we do to save the younger generation because during our times we face certain things but we couldn't open our mouth either to our parents nor to our teachers but now i think it's time for all of us to give that space to the younger ones to come out if they are not in fault because if something has happened to them they have to come out and you know um, point out to the abuser not to keep the abuser uh, happy happy yeah. because if you don't complain they will repeat the cycle of abuse yes. not you means it's somebody else somebody else again you know it's going to happen it's going to, it's a chain reaction it's going to, if you if not you somebody else would be having the same Very problem true. yeah this is there and we are nowadays you know every every school every institution they are having counselors special educators okay at least two to three counselors are there department wise okay and uh, the i've seen so many students are you know aware of it they go running to the counselors to say anything and everything they share so many sweet small little kid is always inside a counselor's room something or the other the kid is sharing with the counselor telling her this is the problem this is the problem this boy in my class had a uh, today he had a he did a bad touch to me and uh, he he is touching me like this like that and they are so aware of it i mean that's the wonderful thing that i am seeing uh, every day day in and day out 
and there are so many adolescent girls and boys go and share their you know uh, actually in this adolescent age they have a lots of confused state they are in a confused state they have lots of questions which are unanswered by the parents obviously parents are not going to entertain any kind of questions like that that's what i was telling you parents are not at all cooperative in these matters many of them at least okay so at least those who are still you know in the conservative thought process so they are not able to you know answer the questions that the young generation is putting so the counselors are always ready and the best part is each and every teacher is a counselor now each and every teacher there in a school is a counselor like for me if i take up i have done my counseling i have done my you know um, uh, even the path, uh, pathological counseling and all those things have been done life coaching and uh, everything we need to we need to actually it wasn't a necessity earlier a teacher need not be a counselor earlier okay now it is a necessity even a class teacher even a teacher who is handling 40 students in a class needs to be a counselor first and then only she is a teacher she needs to a mentor she need to be a mentor and only then only she can be a teacher of the subject okay first initially they expect me to be available to them you know you'll not believe it the 10th standard where i go in the morning they expect me to give them time to discuss all the things that they want to so i'll not straight away go into the uh, teaching i sit there i ask them yes what do you want to talk and one or two students come out openly one or two come closer to me and tell me what is the problem so that is very important absolutely correct they should feel secure sharing their vulnerable state they know that they are vulnerable and they should know the opponent who is listening to them is a secure the my my vulnerability will be secure if i'm going to share with her then they will open up if they feel if they are not able to connect with you in that secure way they will never open up so this is for same for the parents also and for the teachers also okay so they should be free to share their vulnerability and we should be a very very active listener more than a speaker what i feel is a teacher need not always speak a non verbal communicator hona chahiye she has to be a non verbal communicator she needs to just listen to the students and maybe help them giving a you know navigate them through the we may not be solving their problem but we can definitely give them some ways and means to navigate their problem yes that yes. is what is very important yes that's really nice ma'am thank you so much for sharing that so requesting all the teachers the school counselors the managements to focus on the child's mental health emotional wellbeing and then studies If if the child's mental health is good, the emotional well being is good. Definitely, the child will perform well. If the child is underperforming, being absent, not active in class, the teacher should observe this instead of being judgmental. The teacher has to go to the core as to what really is behind the child. Why is the child like this? Absolutely. What? Yeah. What's the reason behind all of this? Than to just judge the child or you know and label the child as dull or you know a slow learner. Find out the reason. Absolutely, I'm very much you know agree in uh, in I second your thought actually, Andrea, because we should never label a child just because a child is quiet. And if a child in your class is quiet and not answering you, or maybe he is not even smiling, or disturbingly you know he is disturbing you, uh, you know you should immediately uh, actually feel something is needed. Some your help is needed there. You should have that instinct within you. You should be. getting a kind of a instinct within you that yes the child requires my help and maybe not publicly you're not going to answer definitely don't judge or definitely don't put off that child publicly just call him to you maybe personally you can talk to him after your class maybe. why were you not participating child like the other boys were or other girls were that is what we need as a teacher we have a lot of role to, it's not just a subject that we need to you know put it across we have got a lot of role to play in a classroom so that each and every child each and every teacher needs to know this she needs to be a counselor first a, a listener an active listener not only a just a listener she needs to be an active listener and then a teacher third comes the teacher's role yes yeah. that's wonderful ma'am i had a wonderful session with you we've discussed all important questions and we touched upon several sensitive issues as well you answered that all so well and i look forward to the second session with you there are several questions uh, that i'd like to ask you and uh, you know elicit the answers from you i really love the session today and i'm really thankful for your time ma'am before we end the session for today 
I'd like to request you to join me in the next session called as part two. This is part one. If you would oblige. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. I'll definitely come. Part awesome. And uh, let us have one more interaction. Maybe, you know, this is uh, already we are across the time now. Yeah. More, yeah. Definitely. I'll definitely give my time and we'll uh, stick to one particular topic and I'll definitely give some kind of insight on that. How, you know, we need to go about uh, educating the younger generation. This is a very sensitive issue that you have spoken today about the mental health of, uh, you know, school going children. Now I see even from class six, uh, must be around 10 year old child is so disturbed in a class comes Absolutely, you know, if you think about yourself in a 10-year-old, as a 10-year-old, you were so happy, bubbling with energy, but that is not there. It's so alarming, you know, situation. Out of the 40 students, I can see at least three or four students in that state. I mean, this is such an alarming uh, situation that's going on. So we need to work on it. We need to make uh, schooling and, you know, learning a very interesting process. I mean, I work for the, being a mentor, I work to, as I told you, neoteric, one million neoteric uh, innovators I need to bring about. <laughs> That's my mission. That's really nice, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. We look forward to the next session very soon with you. Thanks for inspiring us. Thanks for being strong uh, amongst all the women like out there who look up to you as an inspiration and role model. Thank you so much. Stay well, blessed. Stay you. connected. Wonderful. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Thank you dear. My dear friends, do share this video with the right kind of people. You never know who might be inspired by the, all the uh, things that have been shared today. We have uh, spoken on various sensitive issues connected with children, with family members, with women, and of course, with uh, gender, all genders. Like we are not focused only on women or on men. Like all are equal to us. That's what we've spoken and shared our thoughts and views today. We don't mean to hurt anybody's sentiments. If you feel offended, uh, we didn't mean to hurt you in particular. So kindly share this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment to the International Fab Talks. Fab Talks is all about inspiring people in the right way. Creating awareness for the benefit of one and all. Stay blessed and stay safe. Don't forget to love yourself, your family and your, uh, you know, the world at large. Signing off from the International Fab Talks. Thank, Thank you, dear. Thank you. Bye.